the morning of July 2nd, the Union troops braced themselves for an expected attack from the thousands of Confederate forces facing them on Seminary Ridge. But the attack did not come. Confederate General James Longstreet spent a great part of the day bringing up his divisions. Meanwhile, Union lines were being strengthened with every passing hour. Our batteries were planted not actually upon the graves, but close to them within the cemetery. Such are the necessities of war. Our regiment lay behind the hill through the forenoon, the men lounging on the grass till about three o'clock, when the ball opened by the whizzing of shell around our ears. Fire! Ready! Fire! Fire! For two hours now, the most terrific cannonade is kept up at this point and along to the left. For two hours, the destructive missiles come, whizzing, whizzing, bursting, sending down their death-bearing pieces amongst us and crushing through the little strip of woods to our right. But not a soldier flinches. In the midst of the furious storm, General Doubleday rides along and says in a pathetic voice, Boys, you will fight, won't you? The honor of your state is in your hands. This battle is to decide whether Lincoln or Davis is president. Occasionally a battery horse would plunge and rear for a moment and then drop. As I passed on east of the guns, I noticed a fine-looking sergeant of the battery watching eagerly the effects of the shot he had just aimed. And as I came back again two minutes later, he was lying dead by his gun. Men came from the skirmish line in the front with shotgun wounds to arms and legs and head. A company was called to support the skirmishers. Captain Foster, of General Standard's staff, was sent out to station them and was brought back in a few minutes, shot through both legs. We were told by the old warriors that this thundering of cannon must be the prelude to a charge upon our lines, and all watched to see where it would come. About six, the nearing of musketry firing to our left indicated the spot, and in a few minutes, we heard above the din the yell with which the rebels charged. The Confederate Army began its attacks along the Union lines from Culp's Hill, along Cemetery Ridge, and places known as the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, Devil's Den, and the Round Tops. Colonel Francis Randall, with five companies from the 13th Regiment and with the 14th and 16th Regiments, moved to meet the advance. At double quick, they marched down the Tennytown Road and passed the headquarters of General George Meade. We saw a column of infantry come swinging down the Tannytown Road from the direction of Cemetery Hill, in close column of divisions. At a sharp double quick, flags flying, arms at right shoulder, officers steadying their men with sharp commands. They came on as if on review. The Vermonters crossed the field and took position just south of the clump of trees on Cemetery Ridge. The air was thick with smoke, creating a reddish glow around the valley. Rifle and cannon fire, as well as the scream of wounded horses, filled the air. As the Vermont regiments took position on Cemetery Ridge, Confederate forces, having been hit hard by Union units on both flanks, began to pull back. However, just south of the Vermonters' position, Confederate soldiers had captured the battery commanded by Lieutenant Gullion Weir of the 5th U.S. Artillery. General Winfield Scott Hancock, the Second Corps commander, came galloping up to Colonel Randall and asked if he could go down in the valley and get the guns the rebels were hauling off. Then Colonel Randall gave the order, forward double quick march, and away we went down the hill and across the valley with a cheer and a yell for the guns. We charged and recaptured the cannon and took some prisoners. Colonel Randall took the lead on the run. His horse had been shot on the charge and his foot and leg caught in the fall but the boys rolled off the horse, and our colonel, undaunted, hatless, and sword pointing to the cannon, said, Come on, boys, I'm all right. Private Rufus H. Farr, 13th Vermont. Confederate sharpshooters, in position near Peter Rogers' farmhouse, fired upon Colonel Randall and the men of the 13th. Colonel Randall led his troops into the valley of Plum Run and ordered Captain Lonergan and his Irish company to capture the rebels holed up in the Rogers' house. 
Near the door, I saw an officer with a rifle in his hands and called for his surrender. Demanded and received his sword and shouted, Come out here, every damned one of you! My order was obeyed instantly, for the Confederates came tumbling out till we had a large number of prisoners. Captain John Lonergan. As they gathered prisoners, several attempted to make a run into the woods. Their colonel said halt twice without effect. Then he very emphatically said, Damn you boys, stop that running. They stopped, threw down their guns, and came back prisoners. At this point, the Vermonters were dangerously far out in front of the Union lines. Randall, upon discovering enemy troops attempting to flank them, ordered the retreat back to their lines. In all, it is believed that they captured 80 Confederate prisoners and recovered the lost cannons of Weir's battery. No one from the 13th Vermont was reported killed that day. Private Almas Stevens, a 30-year-old from Warren, Vermont, had rolled his rubber blanket tightly across the ends and carried it on his breast. A bullet fired by a Confederate soldier struck the blanket nearly in the crossing point and left 19 holes. Miraculously, Stevens was not injured, but many were not so fortunate. With the darkness, the firing ceased. And then we then heard from our front that sound, which once heard will not be forgotten by anyone. A low, steady, indescribable moan. The groans of the wounded lying by thousands on the battlefield. As the moon was rising, I rode out upon the field in front of our lines. My horse started aside at every rod from the bodies of the dead men or horses and wounded men. Union soldiers and rebels in about equal proportions were making their way slowly within our lines. That night, Private Ralph Sturdivant and Sergeant James Holloway went onto the battlefield in search of Corporal Skinner. Skinner, a member of their company, had been reported wounded and left near the Rogers house on the Emmitsburg Road. We found numerous dead and wounded of both armies in our journey. The buildings at the Rogers house were crowded with the wounded and some dead and others in the last struggle for life side by side and most of them were of the rebel army. Sturdivant and Holloway continued until they met a Union sharpshooter who told them, better go no further in that direction for Johnny Rebs are only a few rods away and it's not safe to be roaming about here. None of our boys charged out so far. They hastily retraced their steps across the field filled with dead and wounded. On their way to the road, they stopped to help a young Confederate soldier from Georgia. The 22-year-old man had been shot in both legs just above the knees. His agony and pleading removed every thought of a foe and appealed to our humanity. His pressing request was to be taken from the field, for he said, the battle is not over. There will be awful fighting here tomorrow and I do not want to be run over, crushed to death by horses, feet, and cannon wheels. Private Sturdivant and Sergeant Holloway made several attempts to move the wounded soldier. However, the pain was too great. They moved him to where the dead were not so thick and made him as comfortable as possible. Meanwhile, Corporal Skinner had returned to camp on his own. During the battle, he had been struck by a mini ball in the belt buckle, which saved his life. That night, the 2nd Vermont soldiers slept upon their arms in the open field. Several companies of the 16th Regiment were detailed to picket duty out in front of the lines near the Kadori farm. Lieutenant Benedict got little rest that night. General Stannard, in anticipation of harder fighting the next day, sent Benedict to find the division ammunition train. I spent the rest of the night in search of the wagon, zigzagging around the field wherever I saw a campfire or light. I stopped at a dozen or more of the great Pennsylvania barns. Each of them was a field hospital, its floor covered with mutilated soldiers, and surgeons busy at the lantern-lighted operating tables. By the door of one of them was a ghastly pile of amputated arms and legs, and around each of them lay multitudes of wounded men covering the ground by the acre, wrapped in their blankets and awaiting their turns under the knife. Throughout the night, Benedict rode looking for the supply train, however, without success. The moon, now setting, had become obscured, 
and lacking its guiding light and following a road which I supposed to be that over which I went to Rock Creek Church, but which was really, as I afterwards learned, the Baltimore Pike, I find myself toward morning passing under a tall arch beyond which stood two field pieces in the roadway. Everything was still around, but as I rode between the guns, a form rose from beside them, and a voice asked where I was going. I explained and was told that I would find nothing in that direction till I struck the rebel lines. The arch was the entrance gate to the cemetery, and the rebel lines were nearby at the base of the hill. I had completely lost my way, and but for the warning of the artillerymen, I should now probably be on my way to Libby Prison. So ended the second day of battle. Unfortunately for the men of the 2nd Vermont, the worst was yet to come.